Our topic, of course, is emergent quantum mechanics. And uh, one of the ways of understanding it is, as I mentioned before in the morning, uh, that quantum theory might be an approx approximation to a deeper level theory. Now, uh, there, as we already heard also, there are different uses of the word emergence in this context also. One would be the emergence of theories, the more generally uh, um, formulated way of emergence. And the second one would be more specific physical emergence. Emergence of theory means Quantum theory might be a special case of a deeper level theory for a particular set of parameters. And physical emergence means that quantum systems themselves are modeled as emergent systems. And that's uh, what uh, we want to uh, concentrate on. The problem in getting this topic across is one of the problems is the quantum and emergence communities hardly communicate. It's a little bit better with the uh, gravity or immersion space-time communities, and that's one of the several reasons why we tried to expand the topics uh, at this meeting to include uh, also these communities in our discussion. <clears throat> the problem of acceptance of physical emergence is also related to the question of downward or top-down causation next to the bottom-up causation. Actually, though, there are numerous classical examples in hydrodynamics, for example, self-organizing systems uh, or for top-down causation. Like, for example, i just take one example to illustrate um, uh, what is meant by it. the uh, binar cells, convection rolls, where the form of the container determines the microphysics of cells. So what you have here is uh, some fluid that's heated from below, and you have macroscopic random movement which spontaneously becomes ordered on a macroscopic level. In other words, the emergent particle trajectories depend on the boundary conditions. You see, if the boundary conditions are circular or not, uh, this provides very different behavior of uh, the fluid particles. So this actually is a counterexample, uh, interestingly, also against definitions of realism in the literature, particularly in the quantum physical literature. Because here we have a famous statement by uh, the uh, Zeilinger group um, defining realism like that. All measurement outcomes are determined by pre-existing properties of particles independent of the measurement. Now, as I just uh, tried to indicate, uh, the emergent, uh, physically emergent uh, um, systems uh, do not um, um, uh, agree with this. And in physical emergent quantum mechanics, we don't either. We stick to realism, but not to predetermination. Rather, we have a permanently updated co-determination or co-evolution, and the influences on the microphysics by changing boundary condition or measurement arrangements. So, importing realism into the debate about Bell's theorems could or might eventually lead some historian of science uh, to uh, write a book on a brief history of red herrings, because uh, we believe that um, this type of uh, definition of realism is a kind of red herring. Now, I give you just one example out of the history, which was very influential, which is very clearly uh, seen to be uh, such a red hearing, uh, that is an example from the Feynman Lectures of Physics. He discusses uh, the double slit experiment uh, with electrons, the famous one. And then he says, we now make a few remarks on a suggestion that has sometimes been made to try to avoid the description we have given. Perhaps the electron has some kind of internal works, some inner variables, he doesn't say hidden variables, uh, he says inner variables, that we do not yet know about. Perhaps that is why we cannot predict what will happen. If we could look more closely at the electron, we could be able to tell where it would end up. So far as we know, that is impossible. Now we know that at that time, Bohmian uh, uh, theory was already there for more than 10 years when he wrote that, 
And it was very clear that the hidden variables were not meant to be inside the electron. Rather, it, they were um, defined via the quantum potential, with, which is uh, uh, specifically uh, defined as uh, a quantity that uh, relates to the wholeness of the experimental situation, including the whole apparatus. So obviously, um, this is a, a different way of presenting inner or hidden variables. But then he continues. So if an electron, before it starts, has already made up its mind, A, which hole it is going to use, and B, where it is going to land, we should find P1 for those electrons that have chosen hole 1, and so on. It doesn't really matter how we continue here. Uh, no one has figured out a way of this puzzle. The point is, here we have the complete specification of predetermination. The electron, before it starts, already knows where it goes uh, through which hole and uh, where it's going to land. And then I also quote this because here you see the insistence with which uh, uh, Feynman points out uh, what he's talking about, which uh, somehow amounts to a credo. Uh, he says, at the present time, we must limit ourselves to computing probabilities. We say at the present time, but we suspect very strongly that it is something that will be with us forever, that it is impossible to beat that puzzle, that this is the way nature really is. So here in this description, <clears throat> the electron's behavior is predetermined, independent of us or the measurement apparatus, context independent. Now, the alternative that we would like to uh, discuss and that we study for several years now is to have an electron in an embedding medium, uh, that medium uh, 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 given by the zero-point field, very similar to uh, the SED uh, work by uh, Ana Maria Cetto and uh, Luis de la Peña and others. And this medium uh, might be uh, responsible for mediating information about the whole experimental setup. This is a, a, a bit similar to, uh, or actually an analogy is given by Coudet experiments in Paris uh, with bouncing oil droplets on an oily surface. We had Yves Coudet here two years, and four years ago, and we saw his impressive um, pictures of uh, experiments his group did. So what we have is an oscillator in an oscillating environment, uh, which is non-locally distributed across the whole experimental arrangement. So if we look at the double slit, uh, if you just consider predetermined velocities, you have a, a, a wave coming in with a wave vector k, and then uh, uh, according to slits a and b, you, you just have two uh, ex exemplary um, um, wave vectors Ka and Kb propagating according to momentum con conservation straightforward, in a straightforward manner. So that would be an illustration of predetermined velocities. But emergent velocities in our approach uh, are different. They uh, don't only, uh, they not only refer to the incoming uh, momenta and uh, uh, how they get through uh, the two slits, but also to the whole uh, uh, landscape, we call it a, a thermal landscape, according to the probability distributions at each uh, time step. So uh, uh, this wave is coming through the two slits, and uh, you have a, a probability distribution also immediately after the slits, and this, uh, in, a in a thermal sense, exerts via so-called osmotic uh, momenta, or also diffusive momenta, exerts uh, certain deviations from the straight propagation that we have in the case that we just would consider uh, predetermined velocities. So in the emergent case, these uh, velocities depend on uh, wave numbers kappa, which themselves uh, depend on relative phases due to, the, to, due to this oscillatory landscape which uh, forms part of the influences on the particle. So we have a particle in a medium, and that medium uh, is responsible for, actually, you see in the picture then, uh, trajectories which, for example, do not cross. They don't cross the symmetry line. Uh, 
uh, and uh, they have a kind of uh, strange, or uh, as it's called in the literature, surreal uh, behavior. And I think we'll hear uh, more about surreal trajectories tomorrow uh, by uh, Efren Steinberg, and I'm looking forward to that very much. So uh, here's a, um, a way of having a, an alternative view to uh, the uh, proposal that uh, a realistic theory must have predetermined values uh, which would not be able to actually to reproduce uh, the, the quantum mechanical uh, results as given. In fact, uh, what we propose an alternative is a mutual influencing of local microscopic interactions in the context of the macroscopic boundary conditions and emergent structures. Uh, just like in the analogy with the Benar cells, you have these local dynamics, you have the boundary conditions which then uh, allow the emergence of, uh, of, of new structures. <clears throat> so we call this relational causality, that is a mixture of bottom-up and top-down processes. Um, and actually, one can relate uh, these uh, microscopic interactions to a hypothetical subquantum domain and the emergent structures as uh, the structures we are familiar with in the quantum domain. I published the first uh, set of ideas uh, on this uh, in 1989, quantum systems as order out of chaos phenomena, and I think um, I'm still trying to you know, work on that and, and, and propagate uh, this option. Uh, actually, one of the results that uh, we have obtained uh, uh, in the last few years uh, was a uh, derivation of the de Broglie-Bohm guidance equation, um, which Bohm himself found indigestible insofar as it refers to an influence from configuration space on a particle in real space. How should that be? How, how could that be a realistic theory? Uh, I mean, Travis Norson uh, uh, talked about this today and uh, also is trying to find a way uh, to uh, describe the physics in 3D and not in configuration space. <clears throat> However, we claim that the guidance equation is completely understandable in real coordinate space if you apply concepts of emergence and relational causality. Uh, uh, that more technically, we use, uh, we introduce conditional probabilities, <clears throat> which refer to amplitudes are uh, projected on the totality of all the amplitudes in uh, the experimental arrangements. And if you do that, then you can formulate uh, an, the emergent velocity field out of the double slit. I have written down here three different ways. Our uh, 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 very simple equation, compact equation with those uh, prob um, conditional probabilities, then a Bohmian uh, type of formulation for the double slit case, the second one, and the third one is just the usual quantum mechanical uh, uh, probability density current divided by uh, the total probability. And um, we showed that there is an identity between these uh, quantities involved, which means that we have a subquantum uh, theory that reproduces uh, the quantum results for the immersion velocity field of. Uh, uh, after a double slit, for example. Now, uh, we have several uh, um, results in terms of simulating uh, uh, these analytical results with very simple uh, techniques uh, uh, on a computer. And I just show one uh, more recent result that we have. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, we, we have found somehow a new effect in the double slit if uh, you have a beam attenuation on one of the two uh, sides of the beam. Uh, uh, if the beam attenuation is very strong on one side, then uh, there's a, a kind of unexpected behavior to be seen. This is here. Uh, uh, these are just three different um, 
situations of beam attenuation in the first one to the left the attenuation isn't very strong and you still see interference pattern then you go down with the attenuation or uh, the, the right hand beam is getting weaker and weaker and for 10 to the minus 8 roughly compared to to the strong beam you have a very strong deflection of uh, the particles uh, to, uh, to the right you can see that also on a movie uh, beginning with complete interference attenuation getting stronger and stronger and we put it on a loop so you can have a look at it several times so these are essentially Bohmian trajectories which we obtain from our completely classical uh, simulation tool um, and this is the effect uh, that we propose which might ev eventually be measurable also with weak measurement techniques so and there's also an example of incoherent cases uh, in this case uh, of course you don't have interference but what I plot here is um, the intensity of the osmotic uh, current which is as I mentioned before involved in deviating the particles from the straightforward propagation and this uh, a uh, colorful blob in the middle somehow is responsible for an effect which one would not necessarily expect, namely that also trajectories in the incoherent case are somehow influenced. Uh, of course, the, 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 the probability distribution is as expected in, in, in standard quantum theory, but the trajectories themselves uh, seem to be influenced by this um, diffusive current and it's even more interesting if you have beam attenuation if you have very strong attenuation 10 to the minus 8 again then although the uh, intensity of the diffusive uh, probability density current is much lower it still suffices to deflect uh, the uh, particles from the weak beam whereas the strong beam just goes through and the reason for this behavior is given by the fact that uh, the probability density current, uh, the form is written down here, uh, is highly nonlinear. So uh, this is something that you usually don't look at uh, in ordinary quantum mechanics. You just calculate the distribution functions and you get your distributions. But we explicitly looked at uh, the partic average particle trajectory behavior. And if you do that, you need these highly nonlinear expressions and then you get uh, results which are quite more complicated uh, and different from what you would expect from a purely linear theory. So the nonlinearity of the probability density currents uh, leads to highly complex and non-local uh, um, particle acceleration field for example. I just write down a formula without going into detail. It's just, it just tells you that uh, uh, practically every location of the experimental arrangement and its temporal change will affect the particle acceleration at any other location. And this, of course, immediately brings us to the problem of non-locality versus relativity. Because if that's the case, then the usual argument is, well, if you come from, if an observer comes with a different relativistic velocity than uh, the, the the, the, the planes of simultaneity would uh, change radically and so would the whole connection be different or what? <clears throat> now, usually this argument is uh, brought uh, and I, I'm going to discuss it with this example. Uh, for example, if you take uh, an SP type experiment, you have two photons uh, flying apart and uh, they're being registered. You see, you have the two black dots uh, at uh, positions A and B, and then you have a different uh, a reference frame, and um, if you take the green uh, uh, plane of uh, simultaneity, then you see that the right-hand particle is registered before uh, the left-hand one, but if you take a different reference frame, it's just the other way around. So the question is, in this type of experiments uh, regarding wave function collapse, which one is the true time ordering, ordering if it's one time like this and one, another time like that? <clears throat> Here's a nice quote by Tim Maudlin, which gives partly an answer to that question. 
Relativity reveals some of the apparent contradictions between frames to be merely matters of equivocation. The unprimed frame says that the right-hand photon is detected before the left, while the primed frame has it the other way around. How could they both be right? In this case, the answer is clear. They are simply talking about different things. The unprimed frame notes precedence in its t-coordinate, which we might call time, while the primed frame is concerned with precedence in its own t-coordinate, which we might call prime time. There's no more contradiction between saying that the right detection event precedes the left in time, but follows it in prime time, than there is in saying that Idaho precedes New Jersey in geographical area, but follows it in terms of population. Now, uh, this, uh, we think, is just part of the answer. And uh, the full answer would have to be fully relativistic, and not only talking about time and prime time, but adding space and prime space so that we have two frames, two reference frames, one of space-time and one of prime space-time. And if we do that, we can again uh, draw a space-time diagrams and see what the result is. But before I do that, I bring this other quote by Maudlin, which uh, is supportive of what I'm going to do afterwards. Maudlin says, many would agree that relativity prohibits something from going faster than light. Matter or energy cannot be transported faster than light. Signals cannot be sent faster than light. Causal processes cannot propagate faster than light. Information cannot be tra uh, transmitted faster than light. Or relati relativity requires only that theories must be Lorentz invariant. This requirement is compatible with a violation of every one of the prohibitions listed above. So that's a quite interesting statement, and we want to uh, uh, take up that notion and say, well, let's concentrate on Lorentz invariance. And let's look at uh, the problem I uh, discussed before again, which one is the true time ordering. Again, we have uh, this scenario with two photons flying apart, being registered uh, on the two sides, and now we come with uh, an alternative a reference frame with some velocity, and then we have to transform all, the whole experimental setup, including uh, the detectors from the start, Incl source, detectors, the whole uh, setup from the start, and then we see we just have a rotation of this original square, and this is typical for uh, Lorentz transformation. So what we have here is simultaneity again of the registration of the two particles, t prime equals constant. And whatever other uh, relative velocity you take, you always get uh, Lorentz invariance. And therefore, uh, even this uh, um, instantaneity, this plane of t equals constant, is uh, in accordance with the Lorentz invariance. It's a little bit uh, different and more interesting even if uh, we don't take as an origin the source. If we take as an origin uh, just one of the two detectors, so we, we start again with a, with, a, uh, a f with a light cone and the non-local correlations, and now we take as the origin of the uh, second reference frame uh, just one of the two detectors, then uh, we make the whole Lorentz transformation. And now we could uh, mean that, well, if we measure uh, the photon here at A, then this uh, seems to be in contradiction to what we said before, because it would uh, be registered earlier than uh, the, its arrival at B. But this, there would be an error, uh, because the error made is uh, to believe that the photon, uh, the light cone would be the same in the second. The light cone starts later. We have a universality of uh, the light cone in terms of uh, its propagation with C, but not when uh, the particle is being emitted. So if we uh, uh, also include that information, then we're back to Lorentz invariance. So um, we might have an opportunity for Lorentz invariant superluminal information transfer without signaling, though. And this is uh, the last point I want to make. 
And I'm referring now uh, again to, um, yes, here's the title, okay. I'm referring now again to that paper uh, that I wrote in 89, because there I also proposed an experiment uh, which uh, I thought would have spectacular uh, uh, consequences. Uh, nowadays I know, uh, although the effect was there, the consequences are, um, are not spectacular at all, but what, what you would expect. And I learned this only in 2010 from a paper by Aronoff and Tollaxen and co-workers. Uh, I call this uh, the late choice experiments. Uh, and what you have is a double slit. Uh, and the question is, what happens if you have uh, if you're a realist and the electron goes through one slit and at that time you close down the other slit. What happens? There must be some kind of effect. And uh, Tollaxen and Aron uh, calculated that. They calculated that there would be a mo momentum transfer, a non-local momentum transfer to the electron due to this shutting uh, of the second slit uh, of modular momentum, as they call it. I can't go uh, into detail in that now. But the main message was that you cannot use this for signaling, because even if you shut uh, the second slit, uh, you just shift the particle's position uh, within the uncertainty of uh, uh, the particle. So there may be some shift, but you wouldn't see it. And uh, they refer to this as incom uh, a complete un uncertainty. And uh, we would say that this is, in, in principle, uncontrollability of non-local transfer of modular momentum. And that's why we can speak of Lorentz invariant superluminal information transfer without signaling. Okay, summary. We have a systemic viewpoint, top down and bottom up, relational causality, genuinely context dependent, no predetermination. And the benefits of the model are a causal framework for non local correlation and dynamic non locality, and no contradiction to relativity. Okay, that's us, and that's it. Thank you.